Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches has the top five things that you need for a great shade garden. We build some simple and inexpensive raised beds in our vegetable garden. OSU Assistant Extension Specialist Shelly Mitchell has some fun activities for children to explore what parts of which plants make their favorite foods. And Barbara Brown has a crock pot full of beef and cabbage. As the sun begins to grow more intense as we continue on into those summer months, you might find that you're headed more under the shade of a tree when you're out gardening. If you've ever considered building or constructing a shade garden, here are five features to consider adding to your garden in order to make it a respite during those summer months. While shade gardens traditionally aren't as bright and colorful as a sunny garden, that doesn't mean they're any less visually interesting. You can always add flowering plants into your shade garden, but you also want to think about the foliage. Consider adding plants that have variegation or have foliage that is yellow, white, or even blue. Hostas, heucheras, and sedges make great options for getting foliage interest as well. The other thing with the foliage, you want to think about the texture. Having different textures will also create visual interest in your shade garden. Adding strappy leaves such as the hardy ground orchid or ferny-like leaves from our sensitive fern, as well as bold foliage from bear's britches will all add interest into your shade garden. Also when you're planting your shade garden, think about adding mid-level plants or understory plants. It's one thing to plant the ground with small herbaceous plants, but you also want to utilize that space between those low plants on the ground and the canopy of your trees. That makes a great place for small woody shrubs to grow, as well as small trees such as dogwoods and redbuds. We also have here an example of a woody shrub that works well and provides, again, some interesting foliage as well. This is dwarf fothergilla, and it's actually a cultivar called Blue Shadow. Now you can see it not only gives you great blue leaves, but in the springtime it'll have a white bottle brush-like flower. Not only does this provide blue foliage during the summertime, but this foliage will also provide nice fall foliage as you go into those autumn months. Now, while this one is deciduous, consider also adding evergreen shrubs into your shade garden. Akuba, Japanese Akuba, is another great example of an evergreen that is also variegated to continue giving you interest in the foliage. After you've planted your herbaceous plants and you've got your woody understory plants in place as well, you may think you've planted all you can do in your shade garden but there's more room that you're not utilizing. Consider adding hanging baskets in your trees. While we might not live in the deep south where Spanish moss drapes from the trees, there's no reason that we can't also grow plants from our trees. Here's an example of what we've done. There's a lot of different methods of using different hooks um, to hang plants from your trees, but what we've done here is taken a simple rebarb that we've curved into an S shape. One side of the S goes over the branch and the other half of the S helps hold and support the basket. Because this is a temporary display and only out here during the summer months, we don't have to worry about this damaging the branches too much. But we do keep an eye on it and I would suggest that you do also if you decide to go with this. The other thing about this is the bigger the branch, the bigger the plant. Nothing cools you off faster than water, and adding water into a shade garden not only creates a cooling effect, but also a calming effect. 
Water also is a great feature to add into a shade garden to block out any noises that you might not want to hear. And it doesn't have to be that large of a water feature. Just adding something as simple as this that creates a slow trickle will enhance that meditative experience that you might get in a calm shade garden. Not only that, but it'll also bring birds, butterflies, and maybe a few lizards to the shade garden as well. After all your hard work to create a shade garden, make sure you incorporate a few features to sit back and enjoy your shade garden that you've just created. Include a hardscape path so that you're able to get in amongst those plants to really enjoy them and also be under the shade of the trees. Adding a bench will not only create a destination, but again, a place to sit and enjoy those plants. Also consider adding things like a bird feeder, an arbor, or other garden art to really personalize it and make it your own space. The days are getting hotter, and as a gardener, sometimes it's hard to not overdo it in the heat. But adding a shade garden may just be the relief that you need. Like many of you, we spent this spring revamping our vegetable garden. As you might remember, previously we had raised beds that were just really mounded soil, which is a great way to make a raised bed. It's very inexpensive as it doesn't require any materials. It just really, you need a rake and a shovel to continue to mound up that soil annually. And over the years, that really kind of became more of a problem to have to redo that. And so we wanted to look at something that was a, a little bit more of a permanent structure to keep that soil in those mounds as spaces. And so as we were investigating what we could do that was inexpensive still, um, but would hold the soil better, we went to our local hardware store and found a block that I want to talk to you about here. This is called a planter wall block. And what's nice about this, this is kind of a new sort of concrete block that many of us hadn't seen before, um, but it looks like one of those you might use to set piers for a deck or something. But what's different about it is it has cutouts on the side so that you can slip your uh, two by four, two by six, whatever uh, size lumber into it. And so it really works really nicely here. Now, you could stack these a little bit higher if you wanted to, and what's nice is they're very adaptable to make whatever size raised bed you wanted to. Ours here are two by 12, um, but depending on your size, um, that's what, how much lumber that you would need also. Now these blocks run about $3 and they are available at most big, big box uh, hardware stores. So you would need four to make a traditional raised bed like you see here. And what's nice too is sometimes when you're dealing with raised beds, it's often one side of that raised bed, the wood might rot out. And so it'll be as simple as uh, taking that piece out and then slipping a new board back in. Now keep in mind, depending on the dimensions that you build, you're going to have to fill that with soil. So you want to be aware of that. The bigger the bed, the more soil you're going to have to find to fill that raised bed. Now in our situation here, we were in an existing vegetable garden. So we have pretty much eradicated all of the Bermuda grass in here. So we weren't too concerned about that. Now, if you're in a traditional backyard where you have Bermuda grass that's just kind of taken over the whole backyard and you're looking to install a new raised bed, something like this, you're going to want to deal with that Bermuda grass before you just put a raised bed on top of that um, Bermuda. And the reason why is that Bermuda is going to creep up into your vegetable garden in no time and create a headache for you as you go through the season. Now there's a couple of ways to work on removing that Bermuda grass. Um, a couple of those options would be, one, you could spray it with a weed killer such as, or a grass killer such as glyphosate. You can also use several layers of thick cardboard if you wanted to put that down. Now keep in mind, the cardboard is not going to kill the Bermuda grass. What it's going to do is block out the light and really suppress the growth of it. So it, as the Bermuda grass um, continues to grow underneath that cardboard and the cardboard gets moist and breaks down, that Bermuda grass is going to work its way up possibly into your vegetable bed. So keep that in mind. You're still going to need to be vigilant about that. Another option would be to put down some landscape fabric. Um, most of our vegetables, tomatoes, peppers, and things like that only need about six to eight inches of soil to grow in. So that uh, 
depth here of your lumber would provide enough soil um, for that root zone of your vegetable plants. The problem with the landscape material though is for something like potatoes, that plant is not going to be able to go down any deeper into your soil. So keep that in mind as well. Another option would be to use a sod cutter and actually cut out the dimensions of the raised bed, cut out that Bermuda grass and remove it. Now even though you've removed the top part of that Bermuda grass, I guarantee you there's still rhizomes that are in that uh, under layer of that soil which will work their way up. So really the best option if you're working with a Bermuda lawn and you're looking to add a raised bed like this is to use a combination of those um, depending on what your preferences are. And I would also recommend to do it at least maybe um, six inches to a foot outside of that raised bed because if the Bermuda grass comes up it's going to quickly creep over into your raised bed as well. Um, and also it's less to have to weed eat around. So keep all of that in mind as you're building one of these, but these are a simple way to build a raised bed in your backyard. Hi, today we're gonna to talk about the six parts of a plant. The main parts of a plant are the roots, the stem, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit, and the seeds. So we're actually going to sing a song after we learn about all the different plant parts and what they do. So everybody stand up right now wherever you are and we're going to demonstrate the six parts of a plant on your body. So at the bottom where your feet are, those would be the roots. And the purpose of the roots is to anchor the plant in the soil and that's also where the water comes in the plant. So when we say roots, we're going to touch our toes. Next part of the plant is the stem. Okay, so this is the stem. And the purpose of the stem, it helps the plant stand straight up. And it also has water going through the plant. And then all the sugar that's made during the photosynthesis that the plant uses is all going through the stem. All right, leaves. Leaves are important because they perform photosynthesis. And all that means is they're taking sunlight and they're turning it into sugars and that's what helps the plant grow. That's how they make their own food. All right. Sometimes when it's time to reproduce, some plants make flowers. All right. And flowers get pollinated and they make seeds. All right. And they turn into a fruit. So we have the flowers that turn into a fruit with the seeds inside. So to represent fruit, we act like we just harvested a bunch of apples and we're carrying them in our shirt. That's fruit. And then the seeds inside the fruit. All right, so is everybody ready? We're gonna sing a song about the six parts of the plants. And it's to the tune of the Adams Family or the Days of the Week song, depending on what age you are. All right, so here it goes. Da-na-na-na, 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 da-na-na-na. There's roots and stems and leaves, flowers, fruit, and seeds. You roll them all together, you got the parts of the plant. Parts of the plant, parts of the plant, parts of the plant, parts of the plant. Now that we've talked about the six parts of the plant, we're going to talk about some of the food we eat and determine what part of the plant it comes from. All right, so remember the six parts of the plant are the roots, the stems, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit, and the seeds. So we're gonna give you guys a quiz and see if you can figure it out. All right, peppers. Now peppers don't taste sweet, but they have seeds inside. And if it has seeds inside, it's a fruit. All right, if you eat salads, Usually there's some kind of lettuce or spinach as the base, and those are actually leaves that we're eating. All right, this one kind of gives it away. Cauliflower, we're actually eating the flower, all right? If you have broccoli or cauliflower and you let it get old, all these little buds will actually open up and be flowers. So when you're eating cauliflower, you're actually eating little flowers. All right, asparagus. 
When we eat asparagus, what do you think we're eating? We're eating the stems. Here's some celery, it's already been cut, but this is also a stem. All right, broccoli, just like cauliflower, all those little green parts on top that look like little buds, those actually are flower buds and they will actually open into flowers. All right, a carrot. Carrots come out of the ground. You don't see them until you harvest them. Those are actually roots. Radish, same thing. It only takes like a month to grow a radish, but they are roots. All right, corn's actually kind of a tricky one. All right, all these little kernels, those are all seeds. So when you eat corn, you're actually eating seeds. All right, bok choy, what do you think those are? Those are leaves. Oh, here's a good one for the summertime, watermelon. All right, now there's seeds inside, so that tells us that it's a fruit. It also happens to be sweet, which is what most people associate with fruit. All right, this one's not so sweet, but it is also a fruit, the pumpkin. All those pumpkin seeds inside tell you that the pumpkin is a fruit. And then wheat, all right? All these little guys are seeds that we mash up to make flour and into pancakes and stuff like that. So those are the seeds. So those are the six parts of the plant we eat. Now I brought some examples so we can see if you guys can figure out some other examples. All right. These are cinnamon sticks. And if you look at the ends, they're kind of curled up because what this actually is, is tree bark that they take off the cinnamon tree. And once they take it off, it curls up into these little sticks. And that's what we use to season our food with. So since these are bark, cinnamon's actually from the stem of the cinnamon tree. You don't see too many of these in Oklahoma. But this is from a coconut tree, all right, a coconut palm. This is a coconut that is still in the husk. So this is not what you normally find at the stores. Normally they take this husk off, all right, because it's really hard to get off if you're not used to doing it. So I brought another coconut that I actually sawed in half, and it's all dried up and old, but the milk would be in here. And this is the meat of the coconut, which you can shred and eat. And this outline right here is what you're used to seeing for a coconut. That is the seed of this. So this is the fruit of the coconut. And what we actually eat is basically shredded seed. That's a really big seed. This is also something you don't find in Oklahoma. This only grows within about 15 degrees of the equator. That is the cacao pod. That is where we get chocolate from. Inside the cacao pod are the beans. Now when they're first harvested, they're in a really milky substance. So they spread it all out and let the beans dry. Then they take those beans and ship them to like Hershey, Pennsylvania, where they're made into chocolate. So chocolate basically is a seed from a fruit. A lot of the herbs we eat, we're eating the leaves. So this is oregano and you just take off the leaves as you need them to season food. You can just have it growing on your windowsill and harvest it when you want. You don't have to buy the dried version. And now that you know what all the food you eat, what part of the plant they're from, you can now say you literally know where your food comes from. Today I'm making slow cooker cabbage soup. 
Uh, cabbage is usually thought of as a cool season vegetable. We use it a lot year round because it is such a, a great keeper. Uh, but it tends to go into slaw and things like that a little bit more often than it maybe needs to. So today we're going to use it a little bit different. This is four cups of chopped cabbage. It is slow cooker, so we're going to put the vegetables in first, which is how most of them work. Vegetables in first and then the meat. This is a soup, so they're going to kind of get mixed together anyway, but uh, we're going to start out right. Uh, two cloves of garlic that I've minced up, or if you're using uh, the pre-chopped variety that you can get in the market these days, that's going to be about two teaspoons. I've got one cup of chopped onion or a medium onion. Let's see if we can knock the rest of that in there. And then also, um, I'm going to add the other uh, dry ingredients. We've got a half a teaspoon of kosher salt, about a half a teaspoon of black pepper, and then a fourth of a teaspoon of ground allspice, which I think uh, really makes it uh, the house smell terrific. My problem with slow cookers is always, if I'm at home with a slow cooker, it's always too slow. So I love them if I'm not going to be in the house, but otherwise I tend not to use them so much. I've also got two tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce. I'm going to put that in there. And then this does have some meat in it. So I'm using a lean, you could also use extra lean ground beef. Uh, you could use other kinds of ground meat as well. Um, I've got beef today. Uh, the advantage to, to using the extra lean is that uh, because there's no time when you can uh, drain the fat away, you want to make sure that you have it fairly lean to start with. I'm going to break this up just a little bit. We can come back later and break it up again. It's going to, to cook just fine without stirring it together, but I uh, kind of would like it to be broken up a little bit before we start. Once uh, you've got it cooked part way, we usually don't open a slow cooker, but uh, we're going to open this one with about 30 minutes left. And if you find that your pieces of meat are in bigger chunks than you want at that point, uh, you can always uh, go back and, and break them apart then. I'm also going to add a about one and three quarters to two cups of a beef broth. This can be either uh, one that you buy commercially or one that you make yourself. Uh, if you're worried about the sodium content, you can uh, get one that's got reduced sodium content or reduced fat content. Uh, all those kinds of things can be found in the market. I'm going to turn this on high for three and a half to four hours with a lid on it. Uh, or you can do it for seven to eight hours uh, on a medium, depending on what you're day's schedule looks like, and then we're going to come back. I've got one that's already worked through all of that, uh, so we'll go ahead and take the next step on this one. This one's cooked for the uh, period of time that it needed to. Uh, this one went on high, so we're just going to heat things through. I've got two cups of cooked rice. Brown rice, if you've got that one, would be a better choice. And this is a great way to use leftover rice. So when I make rice, I usually make more than I need for what I'm doing, and then I have leftovers for other things. I'm going to stir that in just a little bit and get it going in there. I've got two cups of diced tomatoes. These are fire-roasted tomatoes, so you can see the uh, blackening that's going in with that. Uh, two tablespoons of tomato paste. So this is one that you are going to have to stir in well in order to make sure that it's well blended. Looks like I'm leaving a big chunk of it on the spoon there. And we're going to turn this on high and bring it back uh, and let it get nice and hot for about 30 minutes. At this point, because everything is already cooked, it's a matter of heating things through. And then I've got a cup of tomato juice or uh, vegetable uh, tomato juice or a spicy vegetable tomato juice. And we're just going to, again, stir everything together, let it come back to a boil until it gets nice and hot. If you decided it wasn't, it was thicker than you wanted at this point, you could always add some more vegetable broth to it also. Again, about 30 minutes on high with a lid on, and this will be dinner. Okay, that last half hour while everything was getting hot, that was time for you to change clothes and uh, get the kids gathered around the table, and maybe throw a salad on the table with it as well. Uh, but this is what you get, slow cooker, slow cooker cabbage soup. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. I hope you'll give it a try.
There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, Casey will view some Vitex. We'll explore the simple science of the water cycle. Joshua Campbell with OSU Extension in Oklahoma County will show how they're using technology to provide an interactive experience in their display garden. And Barbara Brown will have alternatives for hard to find pickling supplies. We wish you health and wellness. And we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.